Today we're going to look at perhaps the most cited Bible passage in Torahism from a different angle. This is a perspective I've not talked about before on the passage from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about fulfilling the Law and the Prophets. And this is worth spending some time on. The text is found in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, and it's often used as the foundation, the proof text for the false theology of Torahism, which teaches that all Christians are obligated to keep the law of Moses. But when we read this passage in Matthew 5, in light of the, the dynamic, thought-provoking, Middle Eastern teaching style of Jesus, which we find consistently throughout the Gospels, it sheds some light on what he's teaching here about the abolishing and the fulfilling of the law. And even if you don't really have questions about this particular passage, I think you'll find today's discussion pretty interesting, because we're going to first spend some time exploring the amazing teaching style of Jesus, and then we're going to apply it to this passage in Matthew 5. I recently went through all four Gospels and read all the words of Jesus. I wanted to get into his mind and get a sense of not just what he taught, but how he taught it. How did he communicate the truth to us? What kind of teacher was he? It's like when I went through my C.S. Lewis phase and I read a bunch of his books back to back to back. And in doing that, you, you begin to get a sense of who that author is as a person, his thought patterns, his outlook on life, what's important to him. And I would really recommend this rex exercise of reading through the words of Jesus. It, it, it really helped me to get a deeper understanding of our Savior. And I realized that Jesus not only taught using metaphors and analogies and illustrations, but I think that's how he thought. That's how he viewed the world. He was far less concerned with communicating literal facts than our, than our modern Western minds are used to. Now, don't get me wrong, he preached the truth. But he did so much more like a, like a poet than a newscaster. Which isn't to say that Jesus never spoke in literal terms, because he certainly did. His Great Commission, for example, was quite literal. Go and make disciples of all nations as were his two greatest commands, to love God and love people. But you'd be surprised how often Jesus spoke in metaphors and used hyperbole to teach a truth. And while the truth he taught was absolute and concrete, more often than not, he used abstract methods to teach it. For example, he often answered a question with a question. In Mark 10, for instance, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, Why do you call me good? And rather than making direct, clearly worded statements, Jesus often taught in metaphors and analogies. For example, in John 15, he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear, bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So, in what sense is Jesus a vine? And, and what does he mean, every branch in me? And in what sense is he using the idea of fruit here? So, rather than a straight, factual description, Jesus gives us a sort of riddle to work out. His teaching style requires us to think and to, to grapple with ideas. So, why did he teach like this? Well, here's my personal opinion. Think about the modern phenomenon called digital amnesia. This is where just about every known fact in the universe is at our fingertips thanks to Google. The answers come quick. And because of that, because we didn't spend time digging through encyclopedias or almanacs or other resources, you know, trying to hunt down and work out the answer for ourselves, we tend to forget those answers just as quickly as we found them. They're, they're transient facts that hit our short-term memory and then fade away. Well, Jesus didn't want to give us transient facts. He wanted to, to challenge us to engage our minds as well as our hearts in what he was teaching, even to the point where his words often leave us thinking, well, I know what he just said, but in what sense did he mean that? In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Oh my goodness, if we take that verse literally, we are all doomed. No one's getting into the kingdom of heaven. So in what sense did Jesus mean perfect here, right? And, and he told the Pharisees that they are sons of their father, the devil. Wow, in what sense did he mean that? These are statements that require us to lean in and wrestle with them a little bit. 
And as I read through so many examples of Jesus giving us ideas and illustrations to grapple with, it reminded me of how Jacob wrestled with God and wouldn't let him go unless God blessed him. And God told him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven or struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And I wonder if Jesus teaches in this way because rather than, than memorizing facts, he wants us to lean in and wrestle with God. Sometimes Jesus would even make statements that seem to contradict the rest of his teachings. And those statements really jump out because they're so incongruous with what you'd expect him to say. They sort of stop you in your tracks and force you to work out what in the world Jesus means. For example, think about the types of teachings Yeshua is known for. He taught that those who are weary and heavy laden can find rest in him, and that he is gentle and lowly in heart, and that the world will know that we belong to him by our love for one another. And he continually taught us to forgive each other, and to love our enemies, and to pray for those who persecute us, right? So then what are we to make of his statement in Matthew 10, 34? Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wow. Okay, that really sticks out. How can the Prince of Peace say that he's not come to bring peace? And how can the Messiah, who told Peter to put away his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and said that those who live by the sword will die by the sword, and that if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, how can he say that he's come to bring a sword? So when we come across this statement, we instantly recognize that Jesus must not mean this literally. In light of the larger body of his teachings and the, New Test and the New Testament as a whole, the words of Yeshua here in this passage cause us to, to lean in and ask ourselves, in what sense did he not come to bring peace? In what sense is Jesus bringing a sword? And in the next verse, Jesus goes on to say, for I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So Yeshua seems to be using the idea of a sword, not to say he's bringing physical violence, but rather in the sense of causing division between people, between family members specifically. And he says, I have come to bring this division. In other words, my mission, the reason I'm here, is to cause division, to... to bring a metaphorical sword, let's say, to, to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. So even if we interpret the, the surface level metaphor of a sword as not a literal reference to, to physical violence, we're still left with a riddle about division and conflict that doesn't seem to fit with the rest of Yeshua's teachings about love and peace and forgiveness. Ephesians 2.17 says that Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Romans 12, 18 says that as far as it depends on us, we are to live peaceably with everyone. In John 17, Jesus prays that we should all be one, unified, just like he and the Father are one. So how can it be his mission to cause division between people and tear apart families? And how can Jesus teach in Luke 14 if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. So in what sense does Jesus mean hate in that verse? These are some hard teachings. Jesus isn't handing out nice bite-sized lessons for us to snack on. These are messy, challenging riddles that require us to, to roll up our sleeves and dig into the text. So in light of this, this challenging and thought-provoking teaching style of Jesus, let's now turn our attention to that passage in Matthew 5 and ask some hard questions. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Here Jesus clearly says that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. So, in what sense do you suppose he was talking about abolishing and fulfilling? Now, I know that might seem like a silly question to ask because the statement makes complete sense at face value. 
why would we think that he meant abolish and fulfill in, in some certain sense? And our Hebrew roots friends feel justified in taking this verse completely literally and building their entire theology around that interpretation. And yet, and yet, like so many of Yeshua's other teachings, there's more to this statement than, than a surface level interpretation can explain. This verse doesn't exist on an island. And to really get what Jesus is teaching here, we need to view this statement in light of the rest of what Jesus taught and all that Jesus did and what the, what the New Testament as a whole teaches us about him. Now, there are a number of examples in Scripture that I could point to, but let's just talk about one, and that's this. The New Testament teaches that it was Jesus who brought the Torah commands for sin sacrifices to an end. Hebrews chapter 10 explicitly teaches this. It says that Jesus appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and that Yeshua offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, and that by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And therefore, there is no longer any offering for sin. Wow, that's a pretty unequivocal teaching. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Mosaic commands given in Leviticus 16 requiring blood sacrifices for sin no longer apply. So in a very real sense, Jesus abolished the Torah's sin sacrifices. And that introduces some tension for us, right? We have a statement from Jesus in Matthew 5 that, if we take it completely literally, contradicts what the book of Hebrews teaches about the Torah's sin, com sin sacrifice commands. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, He did not come to abolish the law. And he adds in verse 18 that not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And yet, we find in the book of Hebrews that Jesus changed much more than an iota of the law. He completely put to rest the Torah's Yom Kippur commands requiring blood sacrifices for sin. They're done. So how can we resolve this tension? Well, one option, and it's pretty drastic, would be to reject the book of Hebrews, right? We could just rip it out of the New Testament. But of course, when we start picking and choosing which parts of Scripture should stay and which parts should go, We've headed off the deep end into heresy, and it's not the Bible we believe, but ourselves. So another option for resolving this tension would be to look at this passage in Matthew 5, and, and just like in Matthew 10, where we need to ask, well, in what sense did Jesus not come to bring peace? We could ask here in Matthew 5, in what sense did Jesus not come to abolish the law? Right? Our Torah-keeping friends suggest that Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law in the sense that he didn't come to bring the law of Moses to an end, that the law remains intact and unchanged. But as we just saw, that position put, puts Jesus in contradiction with the book of Hebrews. So the way our Hebrew roots friends then try to resolve that tension is by reinterpreting the book of Hebrews in a non-traditional way. So, if you watch these Hebrew Roots teachers, like 119 Ministries, for example, does this all the time. When they interpret these problematic passages, you'll notice they say something like, well, the traditional Christian interpretation is this, but let me offer an alternate interpretation. And why do they feel the need to offer an alternate explanation that contradicts the orthodox traditional Christian interpretation? Well, it's because they recognize that they really only have two choices. They can either reinterpret those other passages in a non-traditional way in an attempt to harmonize them with their belief that Christians are still under the law, or they can completely reject them. And most Torah-keeping Christians see the folly of rejecting passages and books of the Bible, so they go with reinterpretation. Now, of course, there's actually a third option here for our Torah-keeping friends, which I keep hoping, they'll, hoping that they'll take, and that's to let go of the false idea that Christians are required to keep the law of Moses. That's a completely unbiblical theology. Okay, so if we can't adopt Torahism's theology, then how should we interpret Yeshua's words in Matthew 5? 
Well, let me suggest the sense in which I believe Jesus meant that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And this is a sense in which the statement nightly har- nicely harmonizes with the rest of Yeshua's teachings and the rest of the New Testament. So the word Matthew uses in this passage that's translated into English as abolish is the, is the Greek word katalisai, and it means to throw down, to demolish, or destroy. And Jesus said he didn't come to do that, but rather to fulfill the law and the prophets. Again, Torahism interprets Jesus to be saying that he didn't come to bring the law of Moses to an end. And we just saw how that that interpretation directly contradicts the book of Hebrews and many other passages which I didn't mention. So I think a more scripturally sound way to interpret Yeshua's words here in Matthew 5 is that he did not come to destroy the law, but to bring it to its intended completion by fulfilling it. So, did Jesus abolish or destroy the law? No. But has it come to an end? Yes. Follow me on this. Romans 10.4 says that Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And the phrase, the end of the law, could mean a couple things. The Greek word in play here, which is often translated into English as end, is the word telos, which can simply mean end, but it can also refer to the aim or the goal or the purpose of something, which is why the CJB translates this phrase as, for the goal, the telos, at which the Torah aims, is the Messiah. And the NIV says, Christ is the culmination, the telos, of the law. The NIRV says, Christ has fulfilled everything the law was meant to do. And what was the aim or the goal of the law of Moses? Well, Galatians 3, verses 24 and 25 say that the purpose of the law was to serve as a tutor or a guardian to guide God's people until Christ arrived. Verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Pretty plain, right? In order that we might be justified by faith, faith in Jesus. But now that faith in Jesus has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under the law. In other words, there are two ways that the law of Moses could come to an end. One is by destroying and tearing it down. The other is by fulfilling it. And Jesus said that he came not to do the former, but to do the latter. I used an analogy in a previous video that I think is is perfect here. Warren Wearsby uses the great example of an acorn to show that there's more than one way for something to end. An acorn can be smashed with a hammer or it can be planted in the ground and allowed to grow into an oak tree. In either case, the acorn comes to an end. It no longer exists. In the case of the hammer, it's destroyed, or we might say abolished. But in the case of planting the acorn in the ground, it comes to an end by fulfilling its intended purpose, its goal, its telos. So we can think of the Mosaic covenant as the acorn and Jesus and his new covenant as the oak tree. And the acorn and the oak tree it becomes couldn't coexist even if they wanted to, right? The new and the old are incompatible. You can't live by the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus at the same time. The law of Moses commanded blood sacrifices for sin. The gospel says there's, that there are no more offerings for sin. They can't both be true at the same time. So in Matthew 5.17, Jesus is saying that he didn't come to smash the law of Moses with a hammer. He came to grow it into the oak tree it was always intended to become, to fulfill it. Okay, so that's the the traditional Christian interpretation of Matthew 5.17. And it harmonizes the words of Jesus with the rest of what he taught and what he did and the rest of what the New Testament says. And it's really interesting to view the rest of this passage in Matthew 5, 17 through 20 in light of Yeshua's teaching style. It brings up a lot of difficult questions. In what sense does Jesus mean until heaven and earth pass away? Is heaven going to come to an end someday? And in what sense does he mean that not an iota or a dot of the law will pass away? Because we just saw that the commands for sin sacrifices have passed away. And and, and what was he talking about when he said, until all is accomplished? Does this mean until God has completed every last thing he ever planned to do, and after that God will accomplish nothing more? And, And what does Jesus mean here in verse 20 when he says, 
unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In what sense does Jesus mean righteousness here? Is he pointing to the Pharisees because they were the ones who, who worked the hardest to meticulously keep all the commands of the law? Is Jesus saying that we need to be even more scrupulous about keeping every iota and dot of the law than the Pharisees were? Or does the statement have to do with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees that Jesus was constantly rebuking? Is he teaching here that we need the true righteousness of faith rather than the artificial righteousness that the Pharisees were seeking through fastidious obedience to the letter but not the spirit of the law? See what I mean? Jesus has a way of stating things that forces us to wrestle with his words. And if I'm being honest, I find this teaching style astounding and frustrating at the same time. And I'm grateful for those parables in scripture where Jesus does explain exactly what he means. And in the case of Matthew 5, 17 through 20, there's a lot to be discovered. The things Jesus is teaching go deep beneath the surface. And I'd encourage you to dig into the text and wrestle with it for yourself. Thanks for spending time with me today thinking through this stuff. Shalom.